can a you can ask questions now or I can hold them to the end. Which would you like to do? All right, well, I'll just keep going then. All right, so here is another study. So since my classes were all flipped, right, <clears throat> and I made the mistake of pointing that out to administrators, they were like, you can put your classes online. And I was like, I want to put my classes online. So how do you sell that to administrators? I can't say that I don't want to put them online because they don't really care what I want to do, right? But they care about what students want to do. So I thought, well, let's do a study because that's my, it's like kind of like, you know, old musicals from the 40s, you know, let's build a barn, let's put on a show. <laughs> so um, this started off, uh, so, this, so this started off, um, I actually got two publications out of this, um, so, you know, that can't be a bad thing, and a presentation. <clears throat> so, so then, you know, then I had to do research about, I, mean, I had to do my lit review about online classes, and, and that helped me learn a lot. Uh, One-fourth of college students, which is about 5.4 million, this was back in 2014, took at least one distance learning slash online course during fall 2012. That seemed like a lot to me. Um, they're typically associated with for-profit, but more and more for-profits are going out of business, and so we've seen a push for online courses, even at public universities, a lot of that is, I won't lie to you, driven for financial reasons because administrators see this as a money-saving way of providing instruction, also right, able to provide instruction to people who aren't face-to-face, -face, who aren't on the campus, right, <clears throat> um, and right, there's some kind of flexibility. And did I mention money? You know how administrators like money, right? That's, that's what they do. So a little bit about the background. There was more and more talk about putting classes online at the University of Akron. And then students started complaining to me, because I'm like the mommy of the department, um, about how many of their classes were online. A lot of these were more social science-y kind of things, like human relations. And then we got a new dean, and he had come from University of Phoenix, and so he was really gung-ho about putting physics classes online. <clears throat> so I was like, okay, let's, let's ask a good research question. How do university students who are enrolled in face-to-face -face engineering technology programs feel about taking courses online, especially if they're courses that students perceive to be difficult, like physics? So I developed a concourse of statements. They pretty much came from conversations with students, conversations from administrators. At the time, not only was I talking to my dean, but we had a, a um, relatively new president, and he had a book club. And because I can't ever keep my mouth shut, I was on the book club. The book club was like faculty troublemakers. Let's put them on a book club. Pick me. So, uh, so, but it gave me an opportunity to talk to him a lot about online classes. So, you know, unbeknownst to these people, I was writing things down, came up with this concourse of statements, and then used um, Fisher's design of experiments to select my Q sample. So I ended up with 45 statements that represented, right, <clears throat> the communications about online classes at the university. Um, and some of those I made sure were from administrators and some were from students, and I labeled them all in, in my Excel program because I love Excel. Um, ended up with 47 of my students. They were in first and second semester of tech physics. They sorted, you know, at their final exam. Um, and then they answered their po post-sort survey questions. They had a lot to say about this. I don't think I had anybody who wrote I put, them, I put them at plus five because that's where they belonged. They were really, this was like a hot, hot button topic, right? They wanted to write a lot. They had very strong opinions about offering courses online. Ended up 60% of my students had taken at least one online class, which is part of why they had so much to say about online classes. So we'll kind of fast forward to the, the um, results. So three factors, 
Factor one, I called it keeping it real and face to face. So it was basically half of the students who participated and they totally rejected the idea of online classes. And, and most of them had taken at least one online class. And boy, do they had a lot to say. Um, they did not like online classes. Factor two said online could be okay, but it totally depends on the course and the instructor. If it's a good instructor, they can make it even good online. If it's a bad instructor, it's even worse when it's online. Um, <clears throat> and they wanted a, they wanted a cost cutting deal. My students are pretty pragmatic. And then factor three was like online's okay as long as it's those writing classes because we don't really like those classes. We don't really care about those classes, but they should definitely not be for any kind of STEM class. We don't make math classes online. We don't want engineering technology classes online. We don't want physics online, right? <clears throat> as long as it's a writing-based course where you read, you write, you answer some questions, we're, we're okay with that. <clears throat> They were also the ones who want to do group work by themselves. <clears throat> so here's a co written comment in the post sort um, comments from somebody who was on factor one. Said, oh, I took a previous online course. It was a decent course, not horrible, but not great. I feel like the traditional classroom setting is a richer learning experience. These are like freshmen and sophomores who don't like writing classes um, than online classes because in a classroom setting there is interaction and collaboration between peers and instructors, which I believe is crucial part of learning. Simply learning to me is more effective in a classroom setting. You know, sometimes my students really impress me. <clears throat> often, they often impress me. Um, and here is comments from, depends on the course and the, and the instructor, factor two, three different people. Um, number 23 wrote, a good instructor is required regardless of the teaching medium. To them, everything is about the instructor. Number 36 said, I like being in a class, interacting with people and talking to people outside of class. I like to work in groups to make sure we are all understanding the material. And number 41 wrote, probably summarize <laughs> this view the best. I think it would be a bad idea if all classes were online. If the professor isn't that good, then the course is going to be tough and students wouldn't learn that much. Some online courses are all right depending on the course and the instructor. And then um, a person who ended up on factor three, online's okay but not for STEM courses. Engineering, physics, or any STEM degree online will deter students and fail miserably. It's like teaching a mechanic to build an engine with a blindfold on. Ends up, because of some of the other things he wrote, I knew who this student was. Before he came to become a mechanical engineering technology student at the University of Akron, he actually went through an online truck repair school. So I, I know, how do you learn to repair trucks by watching videos but not touching tools and trucks? Well, in the end, that was kind of his question. <laughs> seemed, it seemed like a good idea at the time. But, but so he had a lot to say about online classes, especially this kind of thing, right? Because that's how it translated. The idea was you watch videos for this online program, which he paid money for, right? And then, you know, you're supposed to be able to go repair diesel trucks. And then there were some consensus, so that's one of the beautiful things about Q, is where things come together. And then it, part of the interesting thing about consensus was that students agreed to disagree with the statements that came from the administrators, pretty much my dean and the, the then dean and the then president of the University of Akron. <clears throat> um, so students said, oh no, simulated labs are not as effective as those using real laboratory equipment. Totally counter to what my dean, who's not a physicist or an engineer, right, thought, <clears throat> I don't remember what his degree was in education, but his background was like anthropology. Um, and, or the then president whose background was accounting, um, they, they were like, oh, they're just as good. Well, students didn't seem to think so. Um, <clears throat> Students feel like they learn best with hands-on activities in the lab. Engineering technology majors are pretty much hands-on kind of students anyway. Some of these students left engineering because it was 
less hands-on than they had envisioned, and that's how they ended up in, in these programs. Um, <clears throat> They, there was a lot of concern about the difference between interacting with an instructor in an online class compared to interacting with an instructor in a face-to-face -face class. Students wrote things about this as well, right? They felt like it was more difficult to ask questions online, especially if it was problem-solving help. Um, and they were worried about how future employers would perceive students who took online classes or completed a program that was mostly online, which is a great question. I will tell you that, at least at the University of Akron, our transcripts don't differentiate if you took a course online or if you took it face-to-face. -face. So employers don't even know. But maybe that's a mistake. Maybe employers should know. So some conclusions then, <clears throat> three different views, even though, right, they were all in the same class. And 60% um, and of them had had some kind of online class experience. Um, students' views were definitely out of sync with what the administration thought students wanted. Administrators were wrong. They were just wrong, right? So stu administration said students want things online because they love technology. That's what they said. And students wrote things like, just because our generation likes our phones and computers, that doesn't mean we want to take classes on them, right? The administration said that, <clears throat> right, that they had goals that were related to enrollment, tuition, and budgets, right? Students said, if you're saving money, I want to save money, right? Because if you're saving money, they want to save money, right? <clears throat> they didn't see it as more flexible, even though that's how the administration likes to sell it. Um, I never managed to do this, mostly because the then dean and the then president got fired not too long after this. So, but you know, I still keep in touch with one of them, so maybe I'll have him sort it now. I don't know, we'll see, but that would have been fun. And then, literally, the night before I presented this at the Eastern Educational Research Association, there was an article that appeared in Inside Higher Ed, and it was a survey, and, but, it was about high school students and how they thought about online classes. And it was amazing because it's really similar to my study. 48% said they didn't want to take any of their college classes online. 37% said maybe a few of my classes. It'd be interesting if they would have asked them if it was the writing classes, if that would be okay. And then 2% said half my classes. 4% said all of my classes. And 9% said they didn't know. So... I just took this as more proof that, in general, students don't want to take classes online. Usually when I have students who take, say, technical report writing or human relations online, they took it online because they don't like writing. And then you ask them about it, and they say, it's more work online than it is going to the face-to-face -face class. And so then they don't take any more online classes. So other things that I have going on right now, um, because I always have so many questions, so many questions, not enough time. Um, I'm looking at examining large lectures versus smaller lectures in teaching for the first two semesters of, of physics. I might start off with a survey of instructors, and then I just got the IRB approval for doing a new student evaluation of teaching, um, which my students will get bonus points at their final exam this, this semester. Yay, they are, I already told them, they're real excited. And you know, because it's IRB stuff, I have to give them an alternative. The alternative is for 10 points, you could also, you could solve an extra physics problem. <laughs> yeah, they don't pick that one. They always, they're like, and so like this sorting thing doesn't involve actual physics. I'm like, no, it's your personal opinion. They're like, I'll do that. I'm like, good choice. And you know, every once in a while I tell them the story of my student who, one student who didn't do the extra credit was the difference between a B plus and an A minus. Oh, I almost felt bad for him, but you know, I tried to tell him it was a good idea and it would only take like 15 minutes, but he wanted to go, so there you go. Um, and then I might have an instructor Q sort that will come from the survey of instructors of small and large classes to, to differentiate views of instructors, large versus small, which is better what you might do, what might be the compromises between large and small classes. That part is still kind of percolating in my head. And then 
Um, I'm going to continue examining the theoretical aspects of Q methodology. I did, as I might have mentioned, a, a study on free speech on campus, and then I, it's a long story, but William Stevenson is dead because, you know, he first published something in 1935. Um, so long gone, but um, uh, I managed he, his daughters have now passed away and so there were a lot of his unpublished manuscripts and some dissertations and things that aren't ending up at the um, the Center for the History of Psychology which happens to be it's inter international um, happens to be at the University of Akron and so a lot of the Stevenson artifacts are going there but some things they didn't want and I managed to get some and so I actually read this 1951 dissertation so fun because it's all typed with a typewriter and then you know they make little hand corrections and you think yeah because you're not retyping this whole thing that would be horrible <laughs> so grateful for Microsoft Word or anything like that um, but anyway uh, I got inspired to do um, what we call a single case study which delves more into the methodological aspects as well as allowing me to delve more into this speech crisis view that emerged anyway. Um, so I'm working on that because, you know, I'm traveling, and so that's a good time to write. Anyway, um, so that's what I've been up to. Anyway, that's, that's it. We have time for questions and discussions, but, of course, the faculty and students should be careful because what you say may be written down and used as a piece. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's very possible. It's true. Yes. I have two questions. Mm -hmm. First is, what does Q stand for? You know, that's a great question. Um, Q actually does not stand for quantum, which I was under the... No, no, no. It obviously doesn't stand yeah. for quantum. Yeah, yeah, no. It, um, and don't mm -hmm. tell me it stands for the continuum because I don't believe it. No, no, it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't, but I, when we hosted the Q conference, I really wanted the guy who played Q yeah. I really wanted him to come and be a guest speaker. Put his picture on your slide. I know, yeah. right? I mean, he's a public figure, so it's yeah. And he went, <laughs> he went to Kent State, which is just like I 20 know. minutes yeah. down the road. Yeah. So, so you haven't answered the question. Oh, and so when, so when factor analysis first was created, it was R factor analysis. I have no idea why R. And then Cyril Burt actually came up with the idea of instead of grouping items, which is what they do in R factor analysis. So they do that for surveys and um, some other things, like I did it for the force of motion conceptual evaluation to show that it's valid anyway. Um, and But then Sarah Burt decided that he wanted to group people, and he called it Q-factor analysis. And then there's also P, which I don't remember what P is even for. There's P, S, R, and Q. And I think they just literally, it's just a, just a letter. I know, right? <laughs> My other question has to do with the flipped classroom mm -hmm. thing. Um, do you find that it's ever a problem for individual students being made to do group work because they don't have good interactions with their peers because of certain assumptions by um, some people that certain types of students are the wrong kinds of students? I'm thinking mm -hmm. specifically about people of color and um, mm -hmm. people of quote unquote the wrong gender. That's a great question. Usually I have, usually women students tend to group together. And I don't, I don't uh, assign groups. You only have like one right. woman student in your right. class, mm -hmm. and the boys don't want to work with her, yes. and they diss mm -hmm. her, and they diss her, right. and, and so on and so forth. That, I mean, it, it can be an extremely unpleasant experience. Oh, yeah, and it's funny because that usually, I have never had that happen. Okay. I haven't had that happen, but I've had students who. related to the fact that you're a, you're a girl yourself. Yes, probably, yeah, I think so. And, um, so I but, think it's and, something boys should watch out for when they mm, do flip classrooms. I, I, it's yeah. Just, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Well, and, and I've had some, I've had a couple of students who are definitely more like in high functioning Asperger's in the spectrum. Yeah. And students don't want to necessarily work with them and yeah. they don't necessarily want to work with others. Yeah. And, and sometimes I just have students who, they're just kind of antisocial. And, and I used to, force them to be in groups, and I don't do that anymore. I kind of make myself their de facto partner, and I just try to spend more time interacting with them than I do the other groups, which means that I just run around and a lot more, but that's okay, because I need to get my cardiovascular workout somehow. Good answer, thank you. 
but uh, what about the uh, size of your classes? Like um, what size? My my classes are usually 25 to 30. Okay. So, but because I'm on the not nice list, my um in the fall my class will go up to 48. So thus my interest suddenly work. in yeah oh yeah I'm not sure how I'm going to do group work, and and the room that they have me in so I converted the old physics lab which had high tables and then what I lovingly called junior high desks. You know, with the tablets, kind of like these, but they're individual. Um, and then I read, I redid it all, so there's movable desks, and they can make their groups however they want. Um, though that room can only maxes out at 30, because I literally have 30 chairs. Um, and so now I'm going to be in different kind of classroom spaces, and I'm not sure how that's going to work. At one point, the university, when we were booming and didn't have enough classroom space, they made more space by just shoving more junior high desks in classrooms. And I think that I'm going to end up in one of those. So I'm not sure how I'm going to do that. I'm also not sure how I'm going to prevent cheating. Because now that's going to be a problem. You're not a small, well, you're called a small university of Ohio, but you're not small. You're 30,000 students. Yeah, well, now we're smaller again. So now with grad students, we're at 22,000. And as far as like undergraduate population, we're somewhere between 18 and 19,000. They're much smaller than Ohio State. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> like there's a rumor that one day all public universities in the state of Ohio will just be branch campuses of oh, Ohio, Ohio State. State. But it could be just a vicious I rumor. Think Matt had yeah. A question, we'll get mm -hmm. to oh. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've got a bunch of questions, but I'll ask mm -hmm. the one that comes off the top of my head. So with the flipped classroom study, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Passive learners. Is there evidence that the, like amongst one of those groups, that the flipped classroom is more beneficial to them? Do you have some other standard um, metrics that you look at compared to I, the standard classroom? Because I'm interested. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. Okay, there's these two groups, but that's kind of going to happen mm -hmm. with the flipped classroom or the standard classroom. Right. I'm wondering if mm -hmm. the passive learners do they perform better mm -hmm. for some when they're in the flipped classroom that's or, a, the, or the active learners or. Yeah, that's a great question. So, so grades are not a stable measure, but I can tell you one of the interesting things from when I first flipped my classrooms is that what happened was I gave more A's and B's and fewer C's, but the D's and F's stayed the same. And, and that's been pretty consistent. Um, so I think the active learners just become more engaged and then they learn more and the passive learners are still the passive learners. And you know, no matter how hard we try to drag them kicking and screaming through the first and second semester of physics, some of them, I mean, literally, I have some students who are like, yeah, I know I'm not doing well. I'm just going to retake this class. I'm like, OK. And then, then I'm surprised, because then they, they want to take it with me. So it, they don't see that it's me. They know that they didn't get it the first time and they need to do something different. And sometimes they do, and sometimes not so much. And can I ask a follow-up? Have you mm -hmm. tried? Something that mm -hmm. like activate them, like <coughs> the outcomes that are most likely to me based on the way I've been mm -hmm. sorted here. I mean, you don't have to yeah. say for sure the grade I'm going to get, but that might that might be, that might work, or, or, or at least I could. Or they would say, mm -hmm. you know what, I'm mm -hmm. fine with that range of outcomes. That's what right. I expect out of the class, and they can have to with it, right? Right. Well, mm -hmm. and one of the things I did was I made it so the second second semester of physics they can't take it unless they got a C minus or better in the first semester. I got tired of hearing D is for degree. Um, I learned that from my students. I was like, no, D isn't for degree. D is a D. I would cry. <laughs> but they don't see it that way. More like a D minus, all right. Um, but but yeah, that's that's. I should try that. At one point, I did. Seems like it'd be very useful in aligning expectations at the beginning of the semester when you get a larger, large enough. Yeah. Well, and I did something like that at one point where I took. Like I don't remember six semesters worth of data, and because I put all my grades in Excel spreadsheets, because why wouldn't we, right? And I went through and I did, I basically did linear regression with all the data, and I found it. So homework's 10% of my grade, the overall grade, 
but it predicts 89% of the time what your final grade's going to be and what your test grades are. It's the best predictor because the, that was before I flipped the classroom. And it was because the students who were struggling and doing their homework learned because that's why we assign homework. And But it's funny, that didn't, it went right over their heads. But maybe this would actually sink in. I mean, I talk a little bit more in generalities now about the flipped classroom and being engaged, but yeah, it might be better. Even if all I did was show them kind of these results and said, well, look, you know, the, the DF students are the passive ones and the AB students are, you know, because at least DF isn't enough to go on to the next semester. And some of the other classes that require the first and second semester have also gone to the C minus model. So, oh, there was another question. See the grid that you had for mm -hmm. putting the huge stuff out, I noticed that there were fewer spots for the plus five, minus five sections. Mm -hmm. Do you have to pick, you know, these are the two that I wanted to put in the plus five section? Yes, generally, technically, but you can't make them. Um, so, and, and I have been bad at, I usually take every study I do, I usually also participate. I mean, I'm like, none of my stuff is in these studies, but, um, but sometimes I can't just pick two. But the idea is that you want to force them to pick the ones that are the m most important to them. And you want them to really, not struggle, but really think about it. The first study I ever did, which was with my friend Joe, um, we actually did it in a conceptual chemistry class. And I actually had a girl who put, like, in, you had to, you're supposed to put it in like my view, unlike my view, neutral. She put everything in like my view. And I was like, yeah, some of these, some of these statements, like, conflict. You, she was insistent. She agreed with all of them. I was like, okay. She was a quantum mechanic. She was in a supervisor. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. So you, mm -hmm. you. But do you only ever do it once in your class? Um. Because my most like something might be in a bad mood that day. Mm -hmm. I think very classic Sunday mm -hmm. days. Right. Like mm -hmm. you know, it's my study. Yeah. So like, how do you? I don't know. I mean, yeah. Right. It, well, and it because I think the mood thing actually is more. It it if, is more likely to impact or a good mood like evaluation of teaching kind of Likert scale kinds of things than this because they have to compare the statements relative to each other. So I don't think mood will actually come into play. I mean, that's a great question. But but I know that for, well, here I'll take from my very first study, right? It was so enlightening. Um, I had a girl, she was so upset. This female student was so upset because she's like, because they did evaluation of teaching, and then I had them do a Q sort, and it was the same items from the evaluation. And she was she was angry, like angry. <laughs> I was so surprised, so I went over and talked to her, and she said, "I don't like this. It, it requires me to think." <laughs> and horrible um, higher education making students think. She's like, "I don't like this. It makes me think, and it takes way too long." And I was like, "Well, what'd you think about?" The first one, and she was like, I like that because I could do that really fast. So I thought to myself, I really like Dr. Smith. And so I said, hmm, on a scale of one to five, what is she? She's a four. And then I went, bubble, 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 bubble. And I was like, didn't you read any of the questions? She was like, no, she was a four. I gave her fours. That's what student evaluation of teaching gives you. And so that's how, that's why I say I think those things are way more impacted by things like mood, crappy classroom. The worst student evaluations I ever got were in a classroom where for some reason there was something wrong with the HVAC system and the, the fan ran the whole class. I was like hoarse after every class because I was screaming over this fan. And, and I think the environment impacted that classroom. They were also, they were all unhappy, and I really think it was, it was the crappiest classroom I was ever in. Oh, somebody else? Oh, okay. Okay. Oh. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to ask about your opinion.
Mm-hmm. Oh, heck yeah. Oh, let me tell you. There's a reason why my, my friend Joe said, you know how you're always talking about student evaluation and teaching. I'm always talking about student evaluation and teaching. In fact, because I can never keep my mouth shut, um, I actually ended up rewriting our retention, tenure, and promotion article for our current AUP contract. And one of the things I did was I took out student evaluation and teaching. The administration must have missed it because they left it out. <laughs> <laughs> but but there are so many things wrong with student evaluation and teaching. I'll give you my short-ish answer. One, there, there's been so many studies. Um, but First, I'll quote my favorite article from 1957. I don't remember the author. I only know that it's called something like student evaluation of teaching, useful or sacred cow. And, and that really, 1957. And it's just a sacred cow because they're biased. They're biased against women, especially in STEM, right? They're biased against um, instructors of color. It's statistically incorrect, right? Because they, what do they do? They find the mean and the standard deviation. It's not continuous variables. They're not. They're nominal va values, right? So they're not continuous. It's not one to five, and you can have a three point five. And it assumes that everybody in your class has the same view. So, so here, I usually use my, my old, no longer working as my department chair <laughs> as an example. We had a, for evaluation of our department chair, we had a scale, one to seven. How is he doing? One, really bad. Seven, really good. So the person, who is not me, who was in charge of that committee, evaluation the chair, reported the results. And literally, it was like a three and a half. And, and everybody was like, that's really good. And then, but then they had all the written comments. And if you, if you read the written comments, you were like, this dude is not a three and a half. People either love him, boy, do they hate him. So I asked her to plot the data. Oh, yeah. Ones and twos, sixes and sevens. But we gave a three and a half. But nobody had a. Sound like it's out of four, so we would make students. Right, <laughs> right, exactly. And and you just go, but that's not that's not the view. The view is this truly dichotomous viewpoint of this guy, and that the same thing happens in student evaluation and teaching, along with the fact that if the class is perceived to be hard, they're usually going to rate you lower. There's it just goes on and on. I won't go on and on so much, really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, no, that's a great question. Oh, I've asked this question. It's because it's easy. Not because it's good. Not because it's valid or reliable. Because it's easy. Mm -hmm. part of why I'm going to do this new study that's more of evaluation and teach. I've done, I've done a couple before. I only, for a while I had a joint appointment in the College of Education. I actually taught, that's right, pre-math pre teachers because they needed a math ed person. And hey, I have a degree in math. Um, anyway, uh, and I did an evaluation of that class. But this next one is going to be more in 
that line. The problem is that I think it's hard to like expand that over a larger scale, and that becomes the reoccurring problem. I've made enough of a flack about student evaluation teaching on my campus that somehow I've managed to be on some committee that, you know, it's a university committee. It may or may not actually happen. But it's how to re-envision student evaluation and teaching. And, and I think that we're going to have a lot of those discussions. But it, it's not easy. And that's, that's part of why we keep doing something that doesn't actually give anybody valuable information. And I think we do it for the administration. They, they want a number. They want to give everybody a number. My old department chair, the guy who was, you know, the three and a half, I had to sit him down once and explain um, that you couldn't just take the then we got numbers for each class, like a summer. And he would just take all of them and, and then you know, he had four classes and he'd add them all up and divide by four. But, you know, this class had 30 and this class had 16. And I had to, like, explain to him about, like, weighted averages. But but that's what that's what that's what administrators do, and and but they don't care because in the end then they have a number you would get a number and now we can compare your number to the average number, and nobody seems to care that it, it's it's a number and they think that's really good because numbers are good everybody likes numbers but they're not valid they don't so they don't do anything but but it still makes administrators happy sorry for any administrators in the room. Sure. With the study for the online courses.